Okay, so uh, so timetable natin, we should be done by May 10, yung spectroscopy natin. So we have already done module 4.1. So today we will finish 4.2. And maybe next meeting we have 4.3 and 4.4. Tapos by next week, 4.4 to 4.5. What we're going to look at today is just the optical instrument components. So it tackles indirectly 4.3, 4.4, and 4.5. 4.3 is AAS. This one is fluorescent, and this one is vibrational spectroscopy. Now, as you all know, the recordings of these are already available for you. And we have the quiz for 4.2 this week, which is already available, and 4.3 later this week. And then one quiz to cover this two by next week, and the problems that will also be Given. So I just like to remind you that we're almost done. I think we only have what one more month. So if we, if we're going to look at this May 10th, so Nakamali I think this should be a May 12th. Okay. Uh, I don't have any memo that. It's going to be a holiday. May memo bang holiday next week? Wala po, sir. Wala po, sir. So I think this is until May 11. And this one would be May 13. Oh, good. And the next one. So siguro aayusin natin ngayon. May 18. And whatever we have there, so that's May 20 until June 21 to June 1. And then June 2 or June 3. I think I can make this as in June 3. And this one will be June pa, yun last week natin. June, June, June. Because I think the last day is June 9, right? Tama ba? Yes, po, sir. Ito kasi isang meeting lang to, eh. Just June eight. So we 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 what we called numbers already. Ang kulang dito ito. Dapat meron tong vibrational spectroscopy. So have you watched four point two? Napanood yun ba yung ah? module 4.2 because what what we usually do here is we summarize and then if you have any more question for clarification that's the time and if i'm going to look at the coverage of this 4.2 or 4.b uh, or 4b some of them was already discussed in my lesson last time because I, I i look at the different component but the, the specifically what i look there is the uvbs okay so what i'm going to do is i'm going to use the same material that we use in flexible learning or it oh, this is the aas 
but I'm not going to to be what we put into details onto each one. I'm just going to look at the important one, at least here. Okay, so optical uh, instrument components. So it's always five light source. Okay. the sample container, the wavelength selector, the detector, and the readout system. Now, whatever the instrument that you have, the numbering will be different, okay? But it's always the same. The, uh, uh, your optical instrument, whether it's absorption, emission, atomic absorption or IR and Raman, they always have these five components. The light source, the sample container, the wavelength selector or the monochromator, the re, uh, re, de, re, de, uh, detector and the readout system. So if you're going to look at this, component one, four and five are arranged in the same way for most instruments. So usually, this is the beginning and these two are the end. That's how the arrangement of it. So these two and three may change depending on the type of instrument that you have. So if you're going to look at the absorption, showing so UVBs, so the wavelength selector comes in first before the sample container. Okay. Now, how is it different from the emission? It has something to do with the angle that you get the uh, what we call from the sample. So once the incident light goes to the sample, you have to collect at 90 degree angle, okay, any light that is emitted. And what's the other difference between the two? There is an additional wavelength selector in the uh, fluorescence. So we could say this is your excitation wavelength. And this is your emission wavelength. But it still contains the light source, the detector, and the readout system. Now, for the other thing, like the emission and chemiluminescence, okay? So we have here your sample, and then you have the light source, and then you have the wavelength uh, selector, and then you have what we call the detector and the signal processing. So again, you always find the five, what we call components in each of them. So if you're going to look at the optical light layout, as I've told you, one, four, and five, they're always consistent. So the one that is changing is two and three, okay? So in a typical spectrophotometer, you have a single beam and a double beam, okay? So how are they what we call different? So if you have a single bin, you only have what? A single path to the uh, cell holder from the light source. In the double beam, you have both the reference and the sample path for the light source. And you use this to correct for the non analyte absorption signal like reflected or stray lights, the analytes in the reagents or the absorption of the reagent. And if you're going to look the difference, so this is, you could say, the black diagram that you have, okay? Again, you have the light source, the wavelength selector, you have the cell, you have the detector, and this is the readout system. So the amplifier that you have here is just amplify the detector so that you can determine it in the readout system. Now look at the double beam. You have the light source, you have the wavelength selector, and here you have a beam splitter, okay? So what does the beam splitter do? Anyone? Ano yung ginagawa ng beam splitter? Anyone?
What does the beam splitter do? It is split the beam, right? What it do is, if you're going to look at these, uh, what we call black diagram that we have, it is split the beam, the light that you have there. So there's the monochromator that select the wavelength of your light. So when it goes to the beam splitter, one of them goes here, the other one goes there. Okay, so the, the, the difference of this uh, double beam is you have two detectors here. Detector coming from the reference cell and the detector coming from the sample cell. So the beam splitter is a split of the incident light into two beams. You know your main difference, no? The lower. Okay, so if we're going to look at them, uh, in theory, they're still the same. The only difference is you split the light there or, or the beams, uh, the light into two beams, okay? And with this, we could say in the beam splitter, the radiation is alternately, uh, alternately sent to the reference and the sample cell. So this is another way of looking at the black diagram of your uh, double beam spectrophotometer. Okay, this is a little bit more details compared to the one that we have here. So all of them are just made up of what? Lenses and mirrors, okay? Now, the, the, the advantage of the double beam, you have a wavelength that is scanning. So there's a little drip, okay? You can only have one uh, detector like the PMT or you can have two. The disadvantage of this one, this is more expensive. And it's, this is more a uh, little bit complicated, okay? So this is separate by space, double beam, and this is separate by time. Now, I, to I told you that uh, you usually have the five components that you have, and we're going to talk about that, all those I discussed it in another slide from last meeting. You can also look at the single beam and double beam AAS. So look at the difference that you have here. So both of them has light source, okay? And then in the double beam, we already have here a beam chopper. So what does it do? It split the light into two beams, one going to the reference beam, and one goes to your atomizers where you introduce your sample. Okay, so the light source that you have there, there's the atomizer, so you have the sample. So the monochromator that you have there, you set it based on the lambda max of the metal that you want to determine. Okay, so here you could say the samples goes first and then the monochromator. So what does it mean? When you put the light source here, it pass the sample you introduce in the atomizer. So what the atomizer do is you convert your solution there, metal solution into atom. Now, whatever the atom that you have there, it has a corresponding line source. And that line source, you have to set it, the wavelength of that line source, you have to set it in the monochromator when you're doing the AAS. And then you detect it, and then the readout system, okay? Now, the beam chopper that you have usually is a mechanical in nature, just like this one. So just imagine there's a light passing through it. So if the light passes through, so if it rotates, it can chop the light. So it can give you like, trying to see if I can put a line. So usually like,
trying to see if I can do something here. So, so the way that it, it, it looks, if you chop the light there, so usually you have light and then you cut it off, you have light again, then you cut it off, you have light and then you cut it off. So that's what the beam chopper do, okay? So what we're going to do now is let's talk about the different light source, okay? So if you're going to look at the light source, there, there's no such thing as one light source for all spectroscopic method. You need a light source in each spectroscopic method, but it doesn't mean one common light source for all spectroscopic method application. A UV base is a different light source than the emission or fluorescence, then the AAS, then the, U, the what we call the IR. But whatever you do is you always have a light source. Why? Why do you think you, have, you need a light source? Anyone? What do you think is the main reason for having the light source? So remember, spectroscopy deals with what? The interaction of light with matter. So without the light source, you cannot do any of that light matter interaction, okay? So one thing that you can see with the light source, it should be stable, generating a beam of uh, sufficient radiant power needed for spectrometric analysis. So there's two types, the continuum sources or continuous sources, and what we call the line sources. So if we're going to compare the two, one we could say is continuous while the other one specific wavelength, okay? So as I told you, you need a stable source of radiant energy. So the desired property of this light source, it should be stable, okay? It is created for what we call intended wavelength, it should be stable. That means it's constant transmittant uh, radiant power, and it's a good precision. What do you usually do when you use the instrument? Usually what you do, you turn it on, and then you warm it for, let's say 10 minutes to 15 minutes. Now the main reason for that is you want it to be stable, okay? You want your light source to be highly intense. Now, if we're going to look at the light source, we can have a line source. So when we have a line source, this is of a particular wavelength. So you can have this so-called hollow cathode lump, okay, or a laser. Now, both the hollow cathode lab and the laser, we could say they, they are of a specific wavelength, okay? So the laser can be used in Raman, IR, and also we could say sometimes in fluorescence. But the hollow cathode lamp, if you're going to look at this, this is exclusively used in AAS, okay? Now, if we're going to compare the different uh, light source that we have, okay? We have a continuum source. So this one, when we say continuum, usually it's a broad distribution. So if you're going to look at this light source that you have here, it can be like this one. So a different wavelength. Now, if it's line, it emits at a certain wavelength. So continuous or continuum has a broader, uh, what we call spectrum, contain, confirm, co compare to this, what we call uh, line source. Okay. Now, these are the common ones. So as you could see, there's a certain light source for a certain type of spectroscopy. So if you have 
fluorescence, the one that you use is a xenon R clump. And the wavelength that it has is 250 to 600. If it's UV bis, uh, molecular absorption, then it would be uh, deuterium lump and tungsten. Okay. Now, tungsten or halogen lump, you can extend it to near IR absorption. If it's just, uh, we could say visible and near IR, you can also use just what we call the tungsten lump. So if you're going to look at this, in most UBBs, you have both the deuterium and the tungsten lump. Okay? Because the tungsten lump is just in the visible region. If you have a tungsten with the halogen, you can extend it to 40. But if you want one that goes to the UV region, you have the deuterium lump. Okay? And then in the IR, you can have what? Nurse blower, nichrome wire, or the glow wire. So the wavelet region that they have covers this different region. Okay? So the continuum source that you have, you could have tungsten lump or deuterium lump. So it provides okay, a light source at a certain uh, wavelength range. So deuterium lump, it covers the UV region. Tungsten, it's usually more on the UV, uh, no, not, not the UV, the visible region. So if you're going to look at the what we call tungsten lump, it's visible to near IR, right? It's a continuous source and it's a broad range of frequency. So this is based on uh, Max Planck, black body radiation. Okay, when in the heated solid filament glows, light emitted will be characteristic of the nature of solid filament, but more so on the temperature. So if you're going to look at uh, what we call the lamp that you have here, this is what you see. So as you could see here, the deuterium lamp, it's just applicable at least in the UV region. As it goes to longer uh, wavelength, okay, the, the power that it generated is usually lower. So the lamp is made of quartz since glass absorbs light at wavelength less than 350. Okay. Now the hollow cathode lamp that we have here, so usually it is neon or argon at low vacuum. So this is made of the metal having the desired spectrum. So usually you use this in AAS. So different uh, what we call metal, they have their own cathode lamp. There's one for lead. In some, you can have multiple elements okay, in one uh, cathode lamp. But usually what they do, you change it depending on the application that you have. And if you're going to look at the mechanisms of that, so this is how it looks like. Okay, So you have your inert gas. When you iodize it at the anode to high potential, your ionized gas will attract it towards the cathode. And then the fast moving ion you strike the surface of the cup and physically dislodge some of the deposited metal atoms and dislodge it into the gas space called sputtering. So this is why it is uh, what we call specific for a certain gas. And as it continues, okay, the displaced atoms are excited by the collision with the electron and the excited elements relaxes to ground states emit the characteristic atomic emission spectrum of the metal. So the advantage of this is this is specific for a certain element. The disadvantage is it can be expensive because you need to use different lab for each element. And I hope you watch the additional video that we have here, the Shimatsu AA. So this is atomic absorption, right? You can also have source of atomic line spectra, this uh, electroglass discharge lamp. Okay. But the other thing that they use as a good source of a monochromatic light source is the laser. So I think everyone's familiar with this one. No, it's not the same as the what we call the use in sci-fi, that if you're hit by the laser, you can be deteriorated. Okay. 
So this is monochromatic, one wavelength, extremely bright, bright, and it can be powerful. Okay. So it's based on the culminated uh, uh, parallel rays. It's polarized. You have electric field that oscillates in one plane and coherent. That means all waves in one plane. Okay. And I want you to look at this mechanism of this so-called lacing, where, where you do what we call this uh, population inversion. Because if you're going to look at this, there's pumping, okay? the spontaneous emission, the stimulation emission, and then what we call the absorption. So these are, we could say, the different mechanism that you have there. And it's a very good light source. I have uh, what we could work with some laser during my grad studies and postdoc. Okay. The schematic diagram that you have there is you should have an active lacing medium. So usually a certain element. And you pass the mirror there, there's a laser beam there. So that will generate your what we call laser following the different mechanism here. So when you do pumping, the active species of a laser is excited by means of electrical discharge, passage of the electrical current or exposure to an intense radiant source. Okay, so I, I leave the thing to you, but I just trying to let you know, okay, you can watch the video on the production of laser on how laser is being what we could use here. Now, if we're going to compare, the different light source. So these are the different, we could say, application that you have. Okay. So the laser is applicable from UB to this near IR region. The halo cathode lamp that is used in AAS, it's visible at different wavelength in the UB and visible region. So both of them are what we call the line source. But if you look at the continuum or the continuous source, so usually you have the argon lamp, it's vacuum uh, absorption, and then the xenon or deuterium lamp, okay, the tungsten lamp, and then this one in the IR one. So those are the different line source that you use. Okay? And as we go on for each specific spectroscopic method, you will learn about the specific light source that they use. Okay, now let's go with the sample holder. So with the exception, I think, of AAS, you're going to need a sample holder. Why did they say with the exception of AAS? Because AAS, you can just have your sample and then introduce to the atomizer, okay? Because that's where you're going to introduce your sample. But in other uh, spectroscopic methods, your, your, your sample is in the holder. And usually in most of them, there are what? Transparent, okay? And this is how the cubet would look like. And there are only, we could say, not three, but maybe four. But the one that you usually use in absorption and emission, okay, it's usually quartz. So quartz is good from 19, uh, 190 to 3,000 nanometer glass, cheaper than what we call quartz, but it has a limit. You cannot use it if UV region. And then you can also have plastic. At what region you can use plastic? Maybe also at visible regions. Okay. Now the salt, usually you use it at the IR. When you do IR, you can have this so-called cell window. So in the cell window, you have salt window and then you put your sample there now this can be NACL NABR but the one that I use is silver chloride so what do you think is the advantage of silver chloride 
to NaCl when I use AQ sample. Anyone? Anong disadvantage pag NaCl yung window cell ko pag nag ir ako? Tapos yung sample ko eh, AQs. Anyone? In terms of solubility, alin yung water soluble? NaCl or silver chloride? Ha? Huh? Yung NaCl po. Okay. So the, the problem with NaCl, it can dissolve. Okay. If I have aqueous sample, pwede niya madissolve yung window. So usually I use uh, silver chloride. Okay. Now, we use what we call KBR when we do this so-called pelletizing. So what does it mean? So you have solid KBR, you mix your sample there, and then you pelletize it. Usually you form a film. So the way that we do it, we have, alam uh, puncher? You have a cardboard and then you have a puncher, you make a hole. So the way that we do it, when we mix the sample with the KBR, we pelletize it, we put it there, and we form a thin film. Tapos yun yung ginagamit namin. Okay? So yun yung uh, tawag natin pelletizing. I, I think you can watch some video about that. Okay? So yun yung, we could say, uh, parang sample cell if you use this so-called IR. Now, as much as possible, you want your sample cell to be Parallel. Okay. You don't want it to be of different size. What 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 you say of different sa uh, part length size. You don't want it to be like this. What happens if you have a, a a cell like that one? So if the light transmitted there, so mas marami yung na absorb dito, mas konti yung na transmit kaysa dito, mas marami yung transmit. So you want it to be the same. And usually it's around one centimeter pot length, but you can have longer than one centimeter. Okay? So if you're going to look at this, if it's absorption, UVBs, so whatever light enters here, you monitor it. But if it's fluorescence, it is a 90 degree angle. Why? You don't want to pride your detector, okay? Because you have a powerful light source in fluorescence compared to the absorption, okay? So if you're going to look at the sample cell, so if it's lithium fluoride, it can be from the vacuum to the IR. If it's fused silica or quartz, it's from UBB's vacuum, okay, to near IR. If it's NaCl, KBR, that's usually what you use in the IR region. So if you have a silicate glass, okay, or corex glass, so that's around the UV, or the visible region. So yan yung sample cell holder. Okay? So I hope you should try something to do this thing here. Although wala na tayong Adobe Flash. <laughs> Now, we go with the wavelength selector. So usually, ito yung monochromator. Okay? What does it do? It makes your polychromatic light into a monochromatic light. The desired wavelength that you have. So it's usually a narrow band pass that selects the desired wavelength. And you want it to be uh, what we call powerful, high rising power. Okay, so if you're going to look at this, you want it to have this nominal wavelength, the wavelength which a wavelength selector is set to pass. And the width of the band of the radiation, yun yung tinatawag natin effective band width ito. So usually you make it bigger, magiging wider yung wavelength na inaano mo. Okay, so effective band which is the inverse measure of the quality of the what we call device. Now, there are three types. 
of the wavelength selector. It can be filter, it can be monochromator, or it can be interferometer, depending on the application. Okay? So kapag filter lang, okay, it can be this type of this so-called interference, uh, what we call filter. What's the filter that we use every day, especially during summer? Anyone? Anong filter yung ginagamit natin every day? Sunglasses. Okay, we have the sunglasses. It filters out the UV coming from the sun. Now, if it's an interference or uh, what we call the Fabry pair filter, okay? So usually it transmits approximately half the radiation striking it and reflect the other half. So kapag may white light ka doon, ang ginagawa niyan, only one half of that passes through. Okay, and it can be used at different wavelengths. So if we're going to look at the relationship here, okay, uh, dielectric thickness and the transmitted wavelength is similar to this one. I usually, I don't give problems like this. Okay, so that is the, we could say the Fabry Fabro. So it's just, there's a sandwich there. Okay, you, you have a dielectric material that you have there. So usually it's calcium fluoride or magnesium fluoride, and it is sandwiched by a metal and glass. Now, another thing that we could do is the interference wage. Again, it can be applied to different wavelengths. It has a bandwidth of 20 nanometers. So it consists of a mirrored, partially transparent plate separated by wage shape. So the union tower, wage shape, okay, interference wage. Okay. So it can transmit to a wide range of the wavelength. That was meron tayo yung absorption filter. So absorption filter, we could say, that is similar to your sunglass. Usually when we use the laser, we use absorption filter. We don't want the stray lights that are powerful, okay, to be exposed to our eyes. So by using that, uh, what we call filter, we remove the undesired wavelength. What happened is the filter absorbed them, okay? And this is cheaper than the interference filter. And it depends on what visible region you want. So if you're going to look at the uh, absorption filter, it absorbs a significant fraction of the desired radiation and may have a transmittance of 10% or less of their band, uh, what we call peak. So if you're going to look at this, so this is what happened. If you have what we call a green filter, it will cut, okay, uh, one that has uh, what we call a certain web that cut off the green color and then just have what we call the orange one. So yung tawag na din is cut off filter, okay? And it's really, we could say useful. But the one that we usually use is this so-called monochromator. Yan yung ginagamit natin sa scanning. And the components that you have there, there's an entrance slit, a culminating lens or mirror, a prism or grating. So depending on prism or grating yung uh, gagamitin mo, a focusing element and an exit slit. Okay? So depending on prism or grating. So kailan yung grating? Yung grating monochromators based on diffraction. What is diffraction? Anyone? Are you familiar with diffraction? Ano yung diffraction? So usually, you, you, diffraction happen when a wave encounter encounter an obstacle or an opening. So we could say this is what the bending of wave or interference of bending of wave. So kapag merong kang diffraction of light, usually creating monochromators. Yan. So as you could say, this is the light source. 
And in a monochromator, you have the entrance slit. And then you have the culminating mirror or the lens. So, ang meron na ginagamit mo dito is grating. Okay? So, mag a yung grating. It will give you uh, ano ba yung next na focusing element na meron ka dito based on the mirror. And depending what wavelength you want, it will generate it in your sample and then to the detector. Yan yung grating. And if you're going to look at the principle behind here, we could use, say, it's based on the Bragg's law. Yung type ng grating niya. So if you're going to look at the grating here, so meron parang uh, different groups here in your what we call monochromator. Uh, I'm not going to discuss problem like this. Yung problem set natin is mostly on calculation of absorbance. Okay. So based on this grating one, okay, you can adjust it to a particular wavelength. Now, another common thing of monochromator is what we call the prism. So kapag yung grating is based on, we could say, diffraction, prism is based on refraction. So what is refraction? Hmm? Uh, bending of light po, sir, kasi nag-iiba yung medium. So, it has something to do with the bending of light. Okay? So, iba to doon sa tinatawag nating diffraction. Okay? So, refraction occurs when a wave crosses a boundary from one medium to another. Okay? Diffraction, on the other hand, <clears throat> uh, bending of weights around an edge from an object. So if you're going to, to, to look at the uh, what we call to compare it in terms of the drawing, that's an idea. Hindi ako makasulat dito sa PowerPoint na sa ano na to, sa Adobe. So if you're going to look at this here, okay? So kapag tinatawag natin diffraction, so we could say ito yung light tapos may opening dyan. So yan yung diffraction. Now if it's refraction, ito yung light, meron dyan, so magbe-bend. So yun yung pagkakaiba ng dalawa. And if we're going to look at the principle behind, we could say the diffraction, it has something to do with Snell's law. So the Snell's law of diffraction, wherein we say the refractive index is just, uh, the per refractive index one is just equals to sine theta one equals to refractive index two equals to sine uh, zero two. So if both of them are the same, what does it mean? Kapag pareho yung value nila, ano ibig sabihin nito? Okay. So if they're the same, wala kang refraction. So the way, the way that you look at this, what we call uh, prism monochromator, okay? It has something to do with the so-called slit. So meron kayong minimal slit, which is the resolution of absorbs, uh, narrow absorption is needed. At meron tayong tinatawag na wider slit. 
Usually, if you decrease the slit, it results in greater spectral resolution. See this one? 0.512. So if this is smaller, you could see it's sharper. Kaisa dito, which is broader. So makikita mo talaga yung resolution niya. Kapag minim, uh, you minimize the slit. And if you're going to look at the wavelength selector that you have here, okay, so it could be in terms of the prism, okay, the filters, or what we call the gratings. So it's the different, uh, we could say, wavelength selector materials that we have, the widely used spectroscopic sources. But the one that is common is the one that has what we call the gratings. Ano po bang kailangan dito? Ito yun lang for now. And then we have the detector. So yung detector mo, it convert the radiation energy into an electrical signal. So here, you can either have the photon or the thermal detector. And this depends on the wavelength that you use. So you have signal processors that act as amplifier. Okay. And some properties of your detector should be stable. It's sensitive to a wavelength of interest high signal to noise ratio over a considerable ratio of wavelength. Exhibit fast response time. I hope mo matagal, gusto mo uh, rapid, okay? Zero output signal if there's no illumination. And the electrical signal produced is directly proportional to the radiant power. What does it mean? The more powerful your light source is, the higher is the signal that you have. So as I told you, it's either a photon detector or a heat sensitive detector. So photon detector, it responds to the intensity of the electromagnetic radiation, striking them by changing a voltage or current emitted or required by themselves. Thermal detector, on the other hand, responds to heat. And these are the common photon and thermal detector. And as you could see, based on the wavelength range, okay, that's where the, uh, we could say application to. So you have the phototubes, the photomotive priors or PMP, the silicon photodiodes and the photoconductive cells. So as you could see their photoconductive cells, maybe you can apply in IR, but the rest we could say phototubes and PMP, uh, UB, visible region to near IR, and then silicon photodiodes, that's visible region to near IR. And then for the thermal de detectors, as you could see, they're mostly near IR to IR. Bolometers, pneumatic cells, and the pyroelectric devices. So the most common one that they have is the phototubes. I, I, I'm not sure if you still remember the photoelectric effect by Einstein, what that won the, him the Nobel Prize. Photoelectric effect says that the minimum amount of energy must be applied for the electron to be excited. Okay, so it converts the energy of an incoming photon in a current pulse. So conversion is done on a photon uh, emissive surface by the photoelectric effect. But the one that is commonly used is the photon multiplier tube. Okay. So usually what happened in the photon multiplier tube, so the word there is photon multiplier. So this is a photon multiplier tube. So what happened here, okay? So you have dynodes one, uh, D1 to D9. So when numerous electrons pass through here in the first dynode for each photon, so what happened? Okay, so if, the radiation enter it and it strikes the cathode, it's going to convert it to the photoelectron. And then it's going to multiply itself. 
So amplifying the signal that you have, your, your current pulse flow. Okay. But PMP is good, but I think the, the one that is commonly used right now is the PDA, the protodiode array detector. So it has diodes, okay, that are sensitive to the electromagnetic radiation in the visible and ultraviolet spectrum. So you can get the whole picture of the wavelength region when you have a photo diode array. It allows simultaneous measurement of the multiple wavelength. And it's a little bit uh, more rapid okay, than a dispersive instrument. So yan yung usually ginagamit. Now the rest, we, we will discuss them when we go to each of these components. So if you're going to look at this, so UBBs, these are the one that you usually use. And then all are what we call the photon detectors. And then in the IR are the thermal detectors. Now the last part that we have here is your readout system. So readout system is anything that will convert the signal from the detector to something that a user can understand. So ano ibig sabihin to? Pwede analog or digital. Kapag analog, ano yung meron tayo? Usually yung yung mga number tapos meron kang parang ano dyan or kung digital so meron agad na number na nalabas okay so it can be a, a computer display a digital or analog grid out a strip chart recorder or integrator so what it do is just make easier for the user to understand the results Okay, and the thing that you need to remember is some term that maybe uh, you're not familiar with. So spectroscope, that's the optical instrument used for visual identification of atomic emission line. So this is when you have some uh, cathode lamp, okay, or like a element light source, when you look at it, spectroscope yung tawag dyan. You try to determine the line spectra that you have. Then colorimeter, this is where the eye acts as a detector for absorbent measurement. For photometer, it has a filter, but no scanning function. Chlorimeter is a photometer for fluorescent measurement. Spectrometer provides information about the intensity of radiation as a function of wavelength or frequency. Spectrograph, it's uh, you record simultaneously the entire spectrum of a dispersed radiation using plate or film. And then spectrophotometer, it's a combination of spectrometer and photometer. Okay, one that produces light of a selected uh, color and one that measures the intensity of light. Okay, so uh, another term that you can have here yung mga definition, the incident radiant power, transmittent radiant power, absorbance, transmittance, molar absorptivity, absorptivity. So I think this was already covered in the first module. Ah, hindi na ba yung power? Teka lang. Sorry. Um, sir, nasa drawing pa rin pa ba po yun? Or nasa ipo? Ip ha? Yeah, ayun po. Ano lang ayun lang po nakita. <laughs> Yep, na ano ko doon sa thing eh. So th these are what we call straight term, okay? Uh, for you to differentiate them. They're, they're not really what we call the same. So spectrofluorimeter, so that's uh, what we call an instrument wherein you're using for fluorescence measurement. That was meron kang spectrophotometer. So it's just what? Uh, one that has light of any selected color and then a photometer that measures the intensity of light. So you, you have to know the difference between these two. The, 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 what we call the, the, the term that you have here. And, and that's what everything here is covered in the module 4B quiz. 
So question. Question before I take a photo of those who are here. Great screen. Anyone taken the quiz already? Save us. One, three, seven. Uh, zero, four, zero, five, zero, four. So turn on. You, you, yung sputtering na nangyayari, nasa na ba yung ano na yun? Dito pa yun. So, yung sputtering na nangyayari doon sa halo katod uh, lang. So, if you're going to look at the mechanism na nangyayari dito, okay. So, di ba sabi dito, yung gas, inert gas na ionize siya. Okay? Why is it being ionized? Because there's a high potential that that you have there. So once the ionized gas happen, okay, it attracts the cathode. So the presence of ion doon sa cathode na meron ka, so so meron kang fill up gas door. Ina allow niya yung sputtering ng cathode material, okay? So when the gas is ionized at high voltage, uh, when high voltage is applied, so ang nangyayari yung ions nag accelerate siya toward the cathode. And when they hit the cathode, yung pag nag nila yung metals, atoms loose, dyan nangyayari yung sputtering. So pwede, pwede natin sabihin, since there's an energy that is applied there, yung sputtering ng atoms doon from the cathode, uh, parang na-excite yung atoms. Tapos nag -e mix sila ng characteristic lines ng uh, kung ano man metal yung nandoon. So tanong, yung iba... May bago ba dito? Ganun eh. So at least may sampu sa inyo. Pero 12K kanina eh. So question. So next time we'll do AAS and what that? Uh, fluorescence. And I, I like you to look at the recorded slide. Because I, I, I'm not going to what we could repeat again. You in emphasize ko lang yung important part ng no, chapter na yun. Or yung material na yun. So question. Question on anything. <laughs> 